yeah i tried to break down this cheap 30 dollar solar panel that i got off amazon but i obviously wasn't successful i would not recommend that you try this at home i was able to remove the frame pretty easily but all the other layers are glued together with epoxy and it's impossible to separate them so let's just set this aside and let's look at how solar panels convert the sun's energy into electricity we're going to start at the source the main three parts of the sun are the convective zone, the radiative zone, and the core. The core produces almost all of the sun's heat through the nuclear fusion reaction of hydrogen into helium. Fusing just one kilogram of hydrogen releases 360 trillion joules of radiant energy. This energy is carried by packets of light called photons all the way to the Earth. Hypothetically, if we were able to capture all of the sun's energy in one hour, we would produce more energy than the world's population uses in a year. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. In the late 1800s, scientists tried to capture the solar energy of photons with various elements like selenium, germanium, gallium, lithium, and cadmium. In 1954, Bell Labs used silicon to create the first practical solar panel. Pure silicon is extracted from silicon dioxide or sand. A reaction with carbon at 2000 degrees Celsius produces 99% pure silicon and carbon dioxide. This silicon is purified even further using a floating zone technique where the impurities are dragged to one end and 99.999999% pure silicon is dragged to the other. This solid pure silicon ingot is sliced into thin wafers 100 to 200 millimeters in width and 100 to 500 microns in thickness. So why do we use silicon? Well, first off, it's a semiconductor. It doesn't lose electrons as easily as a conductor, and it's not as resistant to accepting electrons like an insulator. Semiconductors are very versatile, and they act as a great base or a starting point. Secondly, its resistivity falls as the temperature rises, unlike metals. This means that when silicon is exposed to the sun and it's heated up, it allows electrons to flow more easily. Another reason is that silicon is the second most abundant material on Earth. Most other semiconductor elements like germanium are scarce, and hence they are more expensive. Silicon has an atomic number of 14, so it has three shells with 2, 8 and 4 electrons respectively. Those last four electrons are called valence electrons. These are tied to other silicon atoms, so it's difficult to excite the silicon electrons and knock them out of their shells. So other elements are added to silicon to provide the free electrons. Phosphorus has an atomic number of 15, with 5 electrons in the outermost shell. When 4 of these valence electrons are tied to silicon atoms, it can readily give away 1 valence electron. It is added to silicon in a process called negative or n-type doping. Boron, on the other hand, has 3 valence electrons in the outermost shell. It needs 1 more electron to become stable. It is added to silicon in a process called positive or p-type doping. This positive-negative silicon sandwich is called a wafer. In the region where these N and P doped silicon meet, some free phosphorus electrons move to the boron atoms and create a stable depletion region with no free electrons. Typically, the top layer is thin and heavily doped and the bottom layer is thick and lightly doped to create a large depletion region. When sun hits the end side of the silicon wafer, more free electrons and voids are created on either side of the depletion region, thus creating extreme negative and positive edges and a potential difference. When a conductor like aluminum wire is connected to the ends, the electrons flow freely through the wire from the negative side to the positive side. So now we've discovered a way to convert solar energy into electricity, but the amount of electricity generated by a single small wafer is negligible. We have to connect thousands of these wafers together in an array to generate usable electricity. The strips of silicon solar cells are connected together with fine metal fingers and larger bus bars made of copper coated with silver 
to improve conductivity. The solar cells are connected in series with a tab wire also made of copper. It links the top negative side of one cell to the bottom positive side of another cell. This cluster of tab wired cells are connected in parallel by bus wires. The bus wires have to carry more current or electrons than a tab wire, so it's larger in thickness and in width to reduce resistance. A single cell generates only 0.5 volts, but this entire panel can apparently produce 24 volts. Next, let's look at the six main components of a solar panel. The middle layer of solar cells are coated in an anti-reflective titanium dioxide coating, which helps prevent the loss of photons. Silicon is a shiny material which can reflect 35% of the sunlight without the coating. On either side of the panel, we have an EVA or ethylene vinyl acetate film. This is a transparent plastic film used to encapsulate the cells and hold them in position during the manufacturing process. On the top side, we have a tempered glass sheet which protects the photovoltaic cells from the weather and impact from hail or debris. Tempered glass is safer than standard glass because it shatters into tiny fragments rather than sharp edged sections. We also have a back sheet which acts as a moisture barrier. It is made from various polymers, usually polyvinyl fluoride or PVF. There's also a junction box on the back side of the panel where all the cells interconnect. This entire system is wrapped in a lightweight interlocking aluminum frame and sealed off with silicon to prevent any water or dust particles from damaging the cells. So to recap, we started off with silicon dioxide or sand, turned that into 99% crystalline silicon, then made a purified silicon ingot, cut that down into wafers, and then used those wafers to make a solar panel. The electricity generated by solar panels is one directional or DC or direct current, it can work for charging batteries or running a single light bulb. But if you want to power many household appliances or even sell this electricity back to the grid, it has to be converted to AC or alternating current. This particular panel didn't come with a solar inverter, but it does have a charge controller, which is a very important part of the solar panel system. It regulates the flow of current to your very expensive batteries and protects them from either overcharging or undercharging. Most 12 volt panels generate 16 to 20 volts of electricity, which can damage batteries. This charge controller ensures that the voltage at the battery does not exceed the 14 to 15 volt range while it's charging. It also drops the voltage to the 13.8 volt float charge level when charging is complete. Additionally, the charge controller prevents the discharging of the battery when the solar panel is not in the sun. So that's an overview of a solar panel and how it works. I have a video coming out soon on the differences between the black or the monocrystalline panels and the blue or the polycrystalline panels. If you have any questions about this video, leave me a comment below. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching. See ya.